Hi, it's Kate Swaffer here. I'm doing a presentation um, that I did recently for the Stride Research Project and uh, specifically doing it now for the Alzheimer's Disease University being held later this week. The topic that I'm talking about is strategies to engage and support people with dementia, both in advocacy and in research. Um, I am the current chair and a co-founder of Dementia Alliance International and also um, a board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. I've got a Master of Science in Dementia Care, I have a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Psychology and I'm a retired nurse. Um, so the first thing to talk about is why we include people with dementia and both in advocacy and in research. Um, on the best practice premise of nothing about us without us, it's really important to, to include people with dementia. Um, historically, people weren't included with dementia in research um, and in the last two decades, the advocacy movement of people with dementia, um, we borrowed the saying from the disability um, community of nothing about us without us. Um, we have a human right to um, involvement and to equal inclusion. Um, we also provide significant and valuable input to research, to policy and to many organisations, including advocacy organisations. Um, there are funding requirements that we need because most of us um, aren't employed, um, but organisations with funding uh, and research organisations need to budget for funding people with dementia as advocates. Um, the other reason that including us um, is that the outcomes of either research or of policy decisions or of advocacy organisations is much more likely to uh, make a real difference to the real lives of people with dementia if we're actively included in, in having a say about what does make a difference to us. So there are many types of advocates. There's an informal type of advocacy. We all do it, so even children do it, for example. They you know, might advocate for a child at school who's being bullied. Um, if we're parents, we advocate for our children, particularly when they are younger, um, or we may advocate, adv advocate for uh, older parents um, or for a husband or wife. Um, we can be formal advocates, uh, such as being a legal guardian. Um, and then there are other forms of advocacy from individual advocacy. So that would be advocating for something that's personal to the advocate or for um, systemic advocacy, which is about changing systems. Um, and then there's uh, directed advocacy, which happens more often through uh, advocacy organisations where um, consumers are engaged to help endorse or influence programmes. And then there's self-directed advocacy, which is really what um, people with dementia do through Dementia Alliance International. Um, and we also say that we believe that uh, advocacy should be much more than about making, making people feel valued or meaningful engagement. Certainly in research, uh, we can be research participants. Um, we can be research collaborators, we can even be research partners or researchers ourselves. Uh, we can be involved in grant writing or reviewing grant applications, setting research priorities um, and members of steering groups or international advisory boards and so on. Um, the prof there is, I think around the world the last 20 years, th there's a lot of people probably like myself who have become very good at advocacy and I guess if I was a newly diagnosed person I would look at somebody like me or like members of the dementia working groups around the world and go well I could never do that um, and I, I, I guess there's a bit of an I call us the professional advocates even though we're not paid but we're used to research language and terminology we're aware of processes we're used to engaging with advocacy organisations, so we actually need less support to participate. Um, so that may make it easier for organisations to work with us, with, with us um, but it doesn't necessarily represent the current cohort of more newly diagnosed people with dementia, and nor does it in fairness represent those people with dementia who perhaps live in nursing homes or um, are less likely to be 
active as advocates. So finding advocates is a difficult job um, often. Uh, it can be difficult uh, even in developed countries due to stigma and discrimination. Um, there are gatekeepers that um, uh, try and keep uh, people with dementia away from either advocacy organisations or from researchers um, because they think it might be too difficult for us. Um, finding self-advocates is definitely easier if you involve other people with dementia in your meetings and events. And when I mean including other people, I don't mean just one or two. I would see that as tokenistic inclusion. Um, and in some cases, it's preferable not to have care partners uh, in attendance at the same meetings. Um, so it may mean for countries who are just developing um, the inclusion of advocates in their work, um, that they may need to bring somebody in from another country who's used to, to uh, standing up and, and doing public meetings and, and that will then encourage people um, in other countries to get involved and Singapore and Taiwan are very good examples of that. Um, finding advocates who are willing to um, be public about their diagnosis in um, low and middle income countries is probably more difficult. The stigma is uh, perhaps worse or different in these countries. Um, families also express more shame about someone in their family um, with dementia, so they're less likely to want a person with dementia to become an advocate. Um, but I think it's really important that you find ways to help bring out the voices of people with dementia so that they can uh, support your organisations to make uh, you know, culturally appropriate decisions about the things that matter to them in your countries. Uh, dementia does cause uh, a lot of disabilities and the WHO uh, states very clearly that it's one of the major causes of disability and dependency among older people worldwide. Um, and that being said, in this particular um, talk, I'll talk about dementia as a disability because to uh, engage and empower people with dementia to, to work with your organisations as volunteers, um, you will need to provide disability support for them. And uh, a travel companion is not enough. That's not enough disability support. Um, asking one person with dementia to attend um, a meeting where there's 30 people in the room without dementia who uh, don't have any disabilities and don't have any issues with finding their voice, um, that actually may disable the person with dementia. So not to provide disability support is like asking a person without legs to climb a flight of stairs. So support to get them involved, um, I think initially you probably need to uh, find strategies to build confidence. You need to provide some training, just like you would if you had a paid employee. Peer-to-peer um, -peer support is a really good way to empower people with dementia to become self-advocates. And that may mean through uh, Zoom groups, through DAI or through uh, other dementia working groups. Um, it may be helpful to provide them with an advocacy pathway um, to help them find out what type of advocacy they're interested in. Not everybody wants to um, be in the media, not everybody uh, likes writing stories, uh, not everybody wants to work on policy. Um, but usually if, if you work hard enough, you'll find people who you can encourage and empower to become active. So building confidence, um, and I, Singapore's done this really well, um, building confidence, uh, we do it through storytelling, um, writing blogs for DAI's um, website, uh, through digital and, and uh, print uh, media as well for advocacy organisations, um, supporting advocates to, to be interviewed on television, to do podcasts for your website. Um, and providing invitations for them to present um, initially in smaller um, groups and then perhaps in, in a broader, uh, more public space. Uh, it can have a really large, storytelling in particular, can have a really large impact um, in influencing public policy and public debate. Um, and there's very good evidence for that. So, uh, you know, I really recommend that. Um, definitely capacity building is worthwhile in, in supporting uh, people with dementia to um, 
work with their disabilities uh, and mentoring and, and perhaps even things like counselling can help um, build up people's confidence. So I personally think that there's been uh, and it continues to be a, a gross underestimation um, of the capacity of all people with dementia, um, even in the later stages of the disease. And so I think it's uh, better to ask what people want to do rather than assume what they can't do. It's really, really important to provide some training for uh, developing advocates. Um, if you did take on a new employee, you would provide them with training, you would help them understand your systems, you would get them to meet people in the team, um, they would be oriented, orientated properly. Um, and so it is with uh, helping to find and develop advocates in your organisations and regions. And, and as mentioned a minute ago, disability support is absolutely essential. Um, some people don't need a travel companion with them, some people do. Um, and that certainly supports um, disabilities during transport to meetings, but it's not the entirety of disability support. So people with dementia um, are increasingly being referred to as experts by experience or people with lived experience. Uh, that's kind of moved from consumer advocate. Um, and I think that what happens is once we take on that title or label, um, it's very easy for people to forget that we have passed professional careers and experiences and still have a lot of knowledge. Um, our past doesn't disappear at the time of our diagnosis. So um, it's important that um, people with dementia are referred to as more than just an expert by experience, but also that you include them at a lot of different levels, not just to provide advice or do media to support campaigns, but um, they should be members of expert advisory groups, um, they probably should be, you should have someone with dementia on your boards. Um, it's the best way to get other people uh, with dementia empowered to get involved and become active to support your organisations. So it's not just about rights. There is a right for us to be involved, but evidence shows that involving people with the lived experience of any condition leads to much higher quality research or much higher outcomes um, and outcomes which are more relevant to the end users. Um, it's also been suggested that this involvement increases the cost effectiveness of research, um, but I would say that that's probably the opposite uh, would happen because you would get a lot of value for money for um, volunteers who usually are willing to give a lot of their time um, but the stigma and discrimination faced by people with dementia is so deeply embedded in our culture that even some dementia organisations struggle how to understand how they can involve people in, with dementia in governance and leadership roles, which does suggest that there's still a, a need to shift perceptions and understanding about the capacity of people with dementia to provide truly meaningful input, meaningful for everyone, not just the meaningful engagement for them. So uh, I think questions to consider as to what extent do your current policies um, equitably include people with dementia? Do they at all? Um, are you paying them even if it's by way of um, vouchers? And if not, why not? Uh, what disability support do you pro provide um, other than perhaps a care partner or travel companion? Um, do you treat the people with dementia in your organisations that you advocate for as equal partners in advocacy projects, policy projects, research projects? It's really important that it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and do you have more than one or two people with dementia involved? And if not, then why not? So I think in closing, um, I would like to say that uh, I feel there's a need to move away from utilising a small subset of individuals and embracing a more diverse and broader uh, range of people uh, with dementia to inform the work um, 
that you're doing um, and to engage with more than, you know, the longer standing, more professional advocates. Uh, I think lower income countries need to be supported in developing really sustainable approaches to involvement. Um, dementia organisations in these countries um, perhaps uh, need to be mentored and supported to embed participation within their organisations. In many countries, we have achieved a significant level of involvement and of contributions from people with dementia. But I think in some ways, this success, this success um, has in, it led to increasing tokenistic use of people. And so I see that the next stage in the development of the involvement of people with dementia will be a need to focus on the quality of the involvement and of equal recognition for the work that people are doing. It is only by truly recognising the value and capacity of people with dementia and by treating them as equals that we will all achieve these much needed changes and that importantly, um, that advocacy organisations will um, have people with dementia stepping up and asking to support your work rather than um, the other way around where you're constantly trying to find people with dementia to be involved. Um, so I wish you all well with your um, organisations and uh, a lot of luck with your um, development of self-advocates. Thank you.